This is the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm your host, Blair Hodges. Have you ever taken a second to read the Institute's mission statement? Uh, Here it is. Our mission is to deepen understanding and nurture discipleship among Latter-day Saints and to promote mutual respect and goodwill among people of all faiths through the scholarly study of religious texts and traditions. In other words, the Maxwell Institute's always been about more than the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies or the Farms Review, now the Mormon Studies Review. See, we focus on texts and traditions beyond our own religious borders. Think of our Middle Eastern text initiative or the work that we do in Syriac Christian texts or the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, through Seapart. We're working to place LDS scripture alongside great texts of a variety of religious traditions. So by looking at other religious texts, which are worthwhile in their own right, we come to understand other faiths better, as well as our own. And I hope this helps give you a sense of why this particular interview, and and more like it on the way, fits into what we're trying to accomplish at the Institute. Over the coming months, I'll be interviewing authors from Princeton University Press's Lives of Great Religious Books series. This is a series where where leading authors or experts write books for general readers that talk about the origins of texts from great religious traditions and and trace how their reception, interpretation, and influence have changed over time. So far, they've done books including the Book of Genesis, the Yoga Sutra. Uh, They've done one on the Book of Mormon. In this particular podcast episode, Bernard McGinn joins me. He's the author of the biography of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, one of the most influential theological works in the history of Christianity. In becoming more familiar with the religious texts of other traditions, like the Summa Theologiae from Catholicism, I hope to give you a greater appreciation for the texts of other religious faiths, as well as texts from the Latter-day Saint tradition. It's Bernard McGinn on Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae on this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Bernard McGinn joins me today. He's the author of a new book in Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. Uh, he wrote a book on Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, uh, one of the largest works in, in Christian history, I would say. Um, but before we get into the book... In general, Bernard McGinn, I I want to start off by talking about the idea of theology in general. So if you can talk about how you became interested in theology and what theology means to you, it will give Mormon listeners a good idea, because the word theology tends to set off some alarm bells for Mormons. They they might say, well, no, we don't have a theology, we have revelation, or something Mm -hmm. like that. And and since you're a theologian, given your background, I'm I'm really interested to hear what theology means to you and, and, and how you became interested in it. Yes, well, um, you know, all Christians and many other religions like Judaism and Islam have a revelation. Uh, We all enjoy some revelation from God. Theology means thinking and talking about that revelation and about the faith that you have. So in terms of the origin of the word, it's just a Greek word meaning a a logos or a word about God. Anytime that any believer in, in any tradition is talking about the revelation and the belief that's fundamental to their lives, talking about it, thinking about it, writing about it, they're doing theology, uh, whether they want to call it theology uh, or or not. So it's it's a broad term, and uh, I think there's a Jewish theology, there's an Islamic theology, there's certainly Christian theologies, and I think Mormons who are seriously devoted to thinking and writing about their own revelation are doing theology, Mormon theology. Now, you earned your doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, is that right? Right, I actually earned what's called a teaching license in uh, in theology, and then I earned a doctorate in medieval history. So most of what I've done is the history of medieval theology. I'm an historical theologian, that is, I look mostly to the past when I, uh, when I engage in my theological work. How did you get uh, interested in that to begin with? Well, I was always, I mean, I was raised and still am a Roman Catholic within a seminary system. And of course, the acme of uh, education in the seminary system is theology, and which I was very happy to study. And I've been doing theology my whole uh, my whole life in one way or another. And of course, Thomas is one of the great theologians, uh, certainly in the whole tradition of, uh, of Christianity. Have you found that work to be fruitful for your uh, religious faith as well? Um has there been a good connection between your experience in uh, studying for, you know, in universities and things and your religious life? 
certainly in my case, and I think in the case of uh, most of the people, or many of the people at least that I talk to, um, I mean, you're called to think about what you believe and how to express it to yourself and to others so that this deepens one's faith, I think, for anyone who is really seriously engaged in, uh, in theology. So the two go together. I mean, uh, they're not, uh, in, in that sense, you know, in two different compartments or wearing two different hats. They're a part of the same person. Now, let's let's zoom in and look more at uh, Thomas Aquinas in particular. Uh, he's the author of the book that you wrote this book about. The first question that I have is, how, how did you manage to write such a short book <laughs> on such a huge topic? I mean, you come in at under 200 pages, and they're small pages for your main text. Well, that was part of the challenge when uh, Fred Apple, who's the editor of this new series at Princeton, asked me uh, to, to write something. I thought about writing something maybe on some of the mystical texts that I work with. But I've been studying uh, Thomas Aquinas and teaching Thomas Aquinas for 50 years, uh, In uh, if you really add it all up. And so I thought, well, I'd like to go back to Aquinas and see if it's possible to do a short, relatively short book on such a gigantic uh, work. I mean, the whole Summa, as I point out, contains over a million and a half words. I mean, it's one of the largest books in the in the Christian canon, certainly. And uh, obviously, you've got to leave a lot out. <laughs> you have to be very selective. I mean, has uh, it, the whole thing even been translated into English? Has the entire uh, Summa been translated? The whole Summa has been translated into English uh, not once but twice, uh, both times by the English uh, Dominican, uh, uh, the English Dominican province, a group of people worked on it, first in the early part of the 20th century and then again in the 1960s and 1970s. And it's been translated into many other languages, including Chinese and most recently Japanese, where a Japanese scholar worked almost his whole life. I think 40, 40 years or more on doing the entire Summa in Japanese. That's dedication. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so for you, you had to, to make a lot of decisions then about how to approach the text to distill it down into this, into this small work. Were there any big obstacles that you had to confront in that process? Well, I mean, I tried to set the context of why Thomas wrote the Summa and the world in which he wrote, the university world of the Middle Ages, the kind of theology we call scholastic theology, and then why specifically he needed a new textbook, because that's what the Summa was. It was a new textbook. Thomas wasn't satisfied with the old textbooks at all. The challenge, of course, was to try to take those million and a half words and give the modern reader some sense of what the, uh, not only the outline, which is relatively clear, but the content of some of the major themes that ride throughout the uh, Summa. And this was the rather long chapter three, which is originally much longer, but for the interests of this series, I had to keep uh, distilling it down. Um, and then, of course, also given the nature of the series as a biography of classics, to talk about the reception. And the reception over 700 years of the Summa, of course, is, is remarkable. Thousands of commentaries have been written on the Summa, let alone the influence of the Summa on other thinkers who didn't want to write commentaries. Some of the commentaries on the Summa, believe it or not, are longer than the original. Wow. <laughs> so, and of course, I cannot pretend to have read them all. No one ever has. <laughs> have you read the whole Summa itself? Uh, I, I put it this way. I've been through the whole Summa. There are sections of the Summa where you don't have to read word for word, sections that relate to, you know, things that are no longer theologically mm. important. Those are sections I've kind of leafed through mm. looking for things. Uh, I think I've read all the important sections of the Summa. So we're talking about a man who, who wrote over a million words here in this massive work that's still talked about in theological circles today, this, this Thomas Aquinas. Who was Thomas Aquinas? Well, he was a uh, child of a noble family born south of Rome uh, in 1225. As a younger son of his noble parents, he would have been expected to become a cleric, and he was actually sent to a Benedictine monastery at Monte Cassino, which was, was within his father's lands to be raised. But they, he was a very clever young man, and they sent him off to the new University of Naples to do higher studies, the Benedictines sent him. And while there, he met the Dominicans, a new order dedicated to poverty, preaching, and study. And he felt immensely attracted to this new order. He joined the Dominicans, much to the chagrin of his family, who wanted him to be, you know, a rich Benedictine abbot and the like. And so at one stage, the family kind of kidnaps him <laughs> and uh, 
holds him under house arrest for a year, but he continues in his uh, persistence and they allow him to join the Dominican order where he's trained in Paris and he spends his whole life as a theologian. Uh, A teacher of teachers would be the the best way to describe Thomas. He dies an early death uh, in 1274. He's not yet 50 years of age. And it's possible he just wore himself out with his mm. tremendous teaching and especially his his, his writing. Uh, so it's not what we'd call an adventurous life in a public sense. It's an adventure of the mind. I mean, Thomas is one of the great minds, certainly, in the history of, of Western thought. And even non-believers, of course, uh, and philosophers and other thinkers will read Thomas Aquinas because of the quality of his thought and engage it, whether to refute it, to learn from it to comment on it, uh, et cetera. So this is an interesting man. This is a deeply intellectual man. But you also paint a picture of a man who who also has a very deep and sincere uh, prayer life in sort of the, the life of, of his spirit was also quite important to Thomas, right? Yes. Well, of course, it was important to the Dominican order in general. But I think Thomas and we, well, we have a lot of stories about Thomas. Uh, some of them were put together for his canonization. So they may have an element of exaggeration, but the general flavor of the lives really gives us this impression of a very uh, pious, very uh, prayerful, very humble person, but a person that I describe as living in his mind. I mean, Thomas, they speak of Thomas as wrapped in contemplation. I think today we'd call him an absent-minded professor. I mean, he is so concentrated on the problems that he's dealing with in theology that in many cases he was kind of oblivious to uh, what was going on around him. So he had a companion, all the Dominican teachers had a companion to help them out, a man called his Socius companion. And Thomas's Socius, uh, Reginald as he was called, probably often had to remind Thomas, well, we have to do this now, we have to do that <laughs> now, et cetera. Yeah. Give us a sense of his output in terms of his writing, because you, you said he was a teacher, maybe a teacher of teachers, given his huge footprint. Um, in addition to the Summa, he, he, he seems to have been a prolific writer in general, right? Oh, he's an amazing writer, I would be the best way uh, to d- describe him. I mean, he wrote long commentaries on the Bible. He wrote long commentaries on Aristotle, the philosopher that he used extensively. He wrote three large syntheses of uh, theology. The first, a commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences. Uh, the second, the thing he called the Summa uh, against the Gentiles. Gentiles here meaning being the pagan philosophers. And then the Summa Theologiae. Plus, he wrote about 100 other works, pamphlets, wow. uh, treatises, etc. I mean, there's millions and millions of words in Thomas's corpus, which has well over 100 works, ranging from works that are short, maybe a few pages, to works that, like the Summa, that take 2,500 pages of double columns in uh, in the uh, English translation. So in the 1200s, how, how widely would those texts have circulated? Were, were they pretty widely read, or was it more an elite class that would be involved in reading those texts? They were certainly widely read theologically. I mean, there was a kind of publishing house or system in the University of Paris in the mm-hmm. 1250s, 1270s, where, you know, the scribes would take these sections of uh, Thomas's work as they come out, and they would copy them. Multiple scribes would copy them and begin distributing them. And we know that the sections of the Summa were distributed pretty broadly and certainly read by all the theological students or Theological students would certainly want to read them. And some early commentators from the early 1300s tell us, well, even lay people like to read Thomas Aquinas, uh, et cetera. Now, whether that's true or not, that's that's what's in some of the sources. Um, and, of course, he is then widely read in the later, uh, in the later uh, tradition and commented on extensively for hundreds and, and hundreds of, uh, of years. So was he in a comfortable position in general with with the church at the time in in terms of uh, his writings? Were there was there any any point of controversies that came up where where uh, church leadership uh, would maybe be questioning of certain things or maybe questions of orthodoxy in, in what Thomas was writing? Were there any controversies in regard to his publications that way? No, there were certainly controversies. Thomas himself was totally loyal to the medieval church and the medieval papacy. Like many medieval theologians on his deathbed, 
He says, I leave all my writings to the Bishop of Rome to determine whether they are, you know, authentic writings and doctrinally correct, etc. Was that like a sincere sort of deference then and not not just some sort of... um... I I think it was very sincere given Thomas' whole life. He was a papal theologian for Mm. a number of years in the 1260s, and the Dominicans, of course, were very much devoted to the uh, papacy. So I think it's totally sincere. But... Thomas's theology was controversial, and there were other schools of theology, particularly among some of his contemporary Franciscans, who felt that Thomas had given away too much to Aristotle, Mm. and therefore accused Thomas not of heresy so much, but of doctrinal error. And so there are condemnations right after Thomas's death of of the excerpts, uh, dangerous excerpts, more in philosophy than in theology, and some of these excerpts are condemned at Paris and at Oxford. Some of these excerpts are obviously positions taken by Thomas Aquinas. So he's a controversial figure uh, as well because of the originality of his uh, of his theology, and he remains that way even though he, he gains a particular status in Roman Catholicism in later centuries. Uh, Thomas was a, was a controversial figure, because it, more in the theological infighting, you might say, hmm. than, in, than in doctrine itself. Yeah, what, so what would the difference be between heresy and, say, incorrect doctrine? What's, what, what would the distinction be? Well, for one thing, heresy is a matter of the will, not of the intellect. One of Thomas's uh, later uh, students, he didn't actually study with him, but Meister Eckhart, in 1326, Eckhart read Thomas extensively, and I deal with the relationship of Eckhart and Thomas in the book there. Eckhart is accused of heresy towards the end of his life in 1326. In his defense, he says, I cannot be a heretic because heresy is a matter of the will, that is, its, its persistence in error. And he says to his accusers, point, me, point out where I'm in error. And if it really is an error, I immediately will retract it mm. because I don't want to be a heretic. I would never persist in that. So uh, in the medieval period, at least, um, heresy is not any error that might come along. It's a persistence in error. Even when it's pointed out to you, that can't be correct. That's against the Christian faith. And a person continues to say, no, but I'm going to still maintain that. So they have a very clear sense of the difference between error and, uh, and heresy that sometimes has been lost, I think, in the more modern period. So we've kind of looked at Thomas Aquinas as, as this deeply intellectual but also deeply spiritual man who was deferent to uh, the church, who spent his life in, you know, writing and teaching to the point of exhaustion. Um, let's let's take a look at the stew in which Aquinas was cooked. I mean, I mean his cultural context and, and his relationship to the church and to the culture uh, a little bit more specifically. Now, you lay this out really well in the book. You, you identify three – uh, main areas. Uh, right, that, Con- that, contexts in a mm-hmm. sense. And yep. That's the papal reordering of, of Western medieval Western, Christianity, yep. the, mm-hmm. the rise of the university in general and scholastic that's, that's theology. Scholastic theology, right. And then the beginning of the mendicant religious life. And I want to touch all on all three of those. You know, So let's start with uh, papal reordering of, of the West. A lot of people think medieval, uh, medieval times were this dark ages of you know, where nothing ever happened. And right. Yeah. Well, they, actually, squalor. they were actually immensely creative period. Of course, I say that as a medievalist, but yeah. I think anyone who, who reads uh, history of the Middle Ages will see that. And uh, when we take the position of the papacy, I mean, the Bishop of Rome from at least the second or third century of the Christian era always had a rather unique position, very special position, but it wasn't really what we would call a jurisdictional or administrative position. Uh, he, he was kind of first among equals uh, frequently in the early mm-hmm. church. And in the early medieval period, frequently the papal office was, you know, fought over by local nobles and not very powerful throughout Europe and dominated by others like the German emperors, etc. It's not until the late 11th century and into the 12th century that a reform of the church takes place, spearheaded in Rome, called the Gregorian Reform because of its association with Pope Gregory VII, that reorganizes the church, gives the pope a unique position in terms of legal power and jurisdictional power, and we talk about then the era really of the, of the high papacy in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, where the pope in a certain sense, certainly the, the, the chief administrative and uh, and CEO of the entire Western Church, the decider, the arbiter of orthodoxy, 
and a very powerful political figure as well. That's the context within which uh, Thomas was born and raised of this, uh, this papal medieval church, which hadn't been the case really in the early Middle Ages. And how did that impact this, the writing of the Summa? I, I suppose Thomas obviously was on board with those changes. Right, very much so, because the University of Paris was a papal university. It's the center of the theological education because it is papally sponsored as the major theological school in all of Western Europe, so that the degrees that it gives are papal decrees and the orders under which it lives had to be approved by the papacy, etc. So that oh, well, there's a lot of local politics that go on as well. But the uh, the way in which the theology of high scholasticism is organized would not have been possible without the papal church of the 13th uh, of the 13th century. Okay, so that's and that's point number two. Then is the rise of of, the, of this type of university and scholastic theology in general, and and that's coupled with the the credentialing of the new papal, you know, uh, right? Yeah, word. yeah. So, but uh, I think uh, the way in which I, when I teach medieval theology, which I've done for many many years, I often talk about three kinds of theology. The first kind is the monastic theology done by the monks within the context of the cloister. And that's the dominant theology in the early medieval period down to the 12th century at least. And that's basically very biblical. It's organized uh, around sermons and biblical commentaries, etc. It's meant for monks because so few people outside the monasteries even could read and write. Mm. Scholastic theology, which begins to come uh, about in the late 11th century and grows in the 12th and 13th century, is a specifically academic form of theology taught within universities to train clergy to take positions of authority, teaching authority and legislative and judicial authority within within the church. And it's a, it's a classroom exercise that's much more organized, much more philosophically grounded uh, and has different modes of writing and different modes of teaching than the monastic theology. For years, of course, in the modern period, we thought that scholastic theology was the only form of medieval theology. Now we know we had a medi medieval monastic theology. And in the late Middle Ages, we begin to get the development of what I've called vernacular theology. And vernacular theology is produced by people out in the world. It's produced in the vernacular languages and not in the learned Latin of the monks or the schoolmen. And it's often a theology produced by women. Uh, it's less technical. It's much more varied in terms of its uh, interests and its uh, the modes of writing that it involves. But it is a real theology. Uh, so that to study the fullness of medieval theology, one needs to look at the monastic, the scholastic, and then the vernacular theology. And vernacular theology is most often a mystical theology. Mm. Something that could could be more readily understood or embraced by just regular, uh, right? Meister, rather, regular worshippers, rather than yeah. Meister Eckhart, whom I mentioned before, is the first example of someone who really uh, puts together the new vernacular theology in his Middle High German sermons with technical scholastic theology, because Eckhart, like Thomas Aquinas, was twice a master of, uh, of theology at the University of Paris. So with Eckhart, you get this unique con con combination of scholastic and vernacular theology. With Thomas Aquinas, we have a master of scholastic theology. We have a few of his sermons that he preached in, in his, uh, uh, he originally probably preached in his native southern Italian Neapolitan dialect, but he doesn't write uh, really in um, in the vernacular mode, uh, at the, uh, you know, in the course of his lifetime. And this is sort of when theology was such a fundamental part of the university, it was thought of as the, the queen of the sciences, right? This is Yes, the, it is. It is the acme of the, of the medieval university is the teaching of theology. Many other things, of course, were involved, the teaching of the liberal arts, the teaching of medicine, the teaching of law, uh, et cetera. But uh, theology is seen as the acme of the th of the whole university system. I like how you laid out the different types of writings that that's, that cropped up within uh, scholastic theology and, and sort of the different roles that they played. There's, uh, if you can touch on these, uh, and I'll probably mispronounce them, but there's glossa, uh, quaestio, dis yeah. disputaciones. Disputaciones, yes, and, and sumae. Yeah, so sume like textbook compendium type thing. Right. So exactly. yeah, so what what were these different types of writings? Well, the medieval schoolmen, the scholastics, were like the monks in that they always started with scripture. 
they started with scripture because that's the basis, that's where we find revelation and the basis for faith. So they were great commentators and they wrote commentaries on scripture or they glossed scripture. Glosses are really just explanatory uh, comments added to the Bible to help explain passages and diff difficult words. So you have glossed Bibles, but then you also have something that Thomas and all the scholastics use. They have a thing called the Glossa Ordinaria, the Ordinary Gloss. It's a huge book which contained the Bible, and all around the text of the Bible were numerous small commentary snippets of passages from the fathers saint augustine were they like signaled by footnotes or were they just sort of stuck in around them stuck in around both in the margins and in and uh, around the scriptural text would be in the middle huh. and the uh the marginal gloss would be written around it top and bottom and sides and then it would be interlinear glosses little things that would be written between the lines of wow. scripture so that's how they studied scripture and how they taught it but then also, of course, the schoolmen commented. Thomas commented on the book of Job. He commented on the Gospel of John. He commented on the Pauline epistles. He commented on the Psalms. That was the foundation of education. And the first two years of Thomas's teaching career, he was what's called a, a baccalaureus scripturarum. That is, he was teaching scripture, taking a book of the Bible and going through it and explaining it to his, uh, to his students. Then he would pass on to comment on the textbook of the day, which is Peter Lombard's book of sentences. And we have, you know, he would be, uh, he would be lecturing on the book of sentences. Only then would he be promoted to a uh, magister, master of theology, where he'd begin his own teaching and where he'd be able to write treatises. And eventually then when he got unhappy with commenting on, on Peter Lombard, he decided to write his own textbook. Uh, so you have, you have, uh, commentaries on scripture. You have commentaries on Aristotle, which would Tom, Thomas would do for his students to teach them philosophy. You have then these great summe, and then you have whole series that you mentioned before of questiones, questions that would be grouped according to disputations. Every Paris master would have to publicly dispute several times each year, and these disputations were on difficult questions in theology. Quite, that's what questiones means. Uh, what is the nature of truth? How do we arrive at truth, for example? And Thomas and his students would conduct public disputations on, on these issues, which then would be written down in these series of questiones disputate. Thomas always chose the most difficult issues. So we have questions, disputa disputed questions on the nature of truth, disputed questions on the nature of evil, disputed questions on the power of God, disputed questions on uh, on the nature of the soul. Uh, these are some of Thomas's most technical writings where he worked out a lot of the issues that later on are briefly summarized in the uh, in the Summa. And these questiones are, are again vast. They, they if you put them all together, they're, they're well over a million uh, words, maybe maybe several million words. I don't know whether I've ever counted them up. Wow. So th that was part of the whole uh, lifestyle of the uh, of the medieval uh, scholastic master like Thomas. So the third category then is the beginning of the mendicant religious life. And and this is something that 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 members of the LDS church in particular are probably not very familiar with at all. So talk about the mendicant religious life and how that came to be what it was that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, at least from the 12th century, late 11th and 12th century on, there's a lot of uh, desire in Western Christendom to, uh, to live what they call the apostolic life, the life that Jesus and his disciples lived. Now, the monks say that they're living an apostolic life because they live in a community, uh, common worship, etc. And it's like the, you know, it's like the picture of the Jerusalem community in the book of Acts. But other people said, well, you know, but if you look back at Jesus and his disciples, uh, they're wandering the roads mm -hmm. in poverty, preaching the good news, preaching the gospel. And that's the real apostolic life. You know, a wandering poor preacher who's conveying the gospel to everybody in society, not somebody who's just sitting behind monastic walls in prayer. And so we have these apostolic movements, um, and uh, throughout the course of the 12th century, some of them run into difficulty and get condemned, but others are kind of absorbed by the church, and among these, the most important are uh, the mendicant orders that come from two gr of the great religious geniuses of the medieval period, Francis of Assisi, who uh, is at the origin of the Franciscan movement, and Dominic Guzman, Dominic, a Spanish priest, 
who was at the origin of the uh, Dominicans. Both of them started around the same time, shortly after the year 1200. Slightly different uh, uh, charisms, we might say today, but they emphasize uh, poverty of life, form of preaching, an outreach beyond monastic walls to the whole community, and in the case of the Dominicans, the necessity for learning good theology in order to refute error and heresy, because there's a good deal of error, particularly the dualistic error of the Manichaeans in uh, in France, in Italy, uh, etc., that Dominic was especially concerned with. So these two uh, mendicant orders, mendicant means begging, because they had no sufficient funds, they basically begged there for their for their livelihood. These two mendicant orders, while there are tensions between them, but there weren't tensions between Dominic and, and Francis, while they do have tensions between them, both represent uniquely new, powerful forms of religious life that revolutionized 13th century church in so many different ways and soon become the leading intellectual uh, intellectuals of the church, as we see in the case of Thomas and his contemporary Bonaventure and uh, in so many other of the, of the uh, mendicants. So why would Thomas uh, choose, say, the Dominican order rather than the Franciscan? What, what would the difference be? Well, it may be a question of accident because there were Dominicans present at the uh, at the University of Naples when he was a young man there in the 1230s. But I also think it's because the Dominicans, right from the beginning, stressed what we today would call the intellectual life. Hmm. That is the necessity for study and the study of both philosophy and theology, and therefore for teaching and preaching that was based on on careful uh, careful theological study. The Francis, Tomine, uh, Francis, excuse me, Francis was you know kind of uh, hesitant about study, uh, although he uh, sponsored some very important uh, intellectuals in the early Franciscans. He really felt the Franciscan way of life was not necessarily a learned way of life. After his death, the Franciscans turned very much into a learned uh, academic uh, uh, order as well. But in the early days, there's a lot of tension between Francis's original followers who say, well, that you know, theology is not really for us. We're for poor preaching and witnessing to the gospel. And then the later Franciscans come along and say, no, we have to study the best theology too. So I think Thomas could have been still conscious of the fact that the Dominicans were far more open to the study of theology than most of the Franciscans. All right, so kind of putting all these things together then, Aquinas, he was in the process of becoming something of a theological authority for the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And, and if I get any terminology wrong here, please you know, don't hesitate to yeah, correct me. Yeah, it's, it takes Thomas a while to become, you know, the authority, and it really is not until the 19th century and neo-scholasticism that mm. Thomas becomes the authority, and I think we're past that era now. Mm. Thomas, for many centuries, was one of the greatest theologians, and everyone still admits that, but there's no single theology in Roman Catholicism, as even contemporary popes like John Paul II have said. You know, there's no, there's no single form of theology. Theology is, uh, is a symphony. As a great theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar used to say, you need a lot of instruments and a lot of different sections of an orchestra. You can't have just trombones or one trumpet. Right. See, and I think that's what's interesting is that there's a certain caricature of, of theology, and especially scholastic theology, and that is that it, its sole purpose is to nail down the answer to every single question or to have this system in place that's all perfect and well and good. But it seems that within Catholicism, there there was always then at least a certain recognition that there would be uh, open questions, that there would be things to be discussed. They did have certain boundaries, obviously, and, and, and certain, you know, there was orthodoxy and heterodoxy. But also there seems to have been the ability of of different perspectives within the church is that is that accurate no i think that's i, I think that's very accurate and uh, thomas always considered himself a theologian and he always tried to be the best theologian he could be he was always willing to engage in discussion about his views at one stage you know he writes and he says you know if you don't agree with what i've said write against me because right. the only way to get to the truth is by by really good discussion and, mm -hmm. and argument, uh, et cetera. So he's always willing to be corrected if necessary or to learn uh, or to learn something new. And the structure of the sum, of course, lends itself to the idea that somehow this is all cut and dried because it's so academic. It was designed as a specific form of textbook. Mm -hmm. But as you begin reading it, you see how many open questions there are. 
both in terms of Thomas's own views and also in terms of how we interpret some of the things that Thomas said. Thomas is marvelously clear, but we're not always quite sure <laughs> what what the best interpretation mm-hmm. of uh, of his thought uh, of his thought may be. And Thomas, I always, have always insisted, is what we call a negative theologian, a negative or apophatic theology. That is, he says. We can have no knowledge of God's essence. We cannot know what God is. We know that God is, and we know that God has told us certain things in the scripture that we know are true, but we cannot really know what God is or what these deep mysteries are. We can, however, try as far as we are able to gain some slight understanding, and we can also try to see what views are erroneous when they're ascribed to God or to the things that God have said. So there's a, despite the million and a half words in the Summa, Thomas has a very powerful notions of the limitation, every, the limitation of all theology. Hmm. I'm talking with Bernard McGinn. He's the author of a volume about Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologia uh, in Princeton's Great Lives of Religious Book series. I want to talk about sapientia, the idea of sapien- sapientia. Sapientia, yes. Sapientia. So this wisdom, wisdom yes. Wisdom, yeah. yes. So you said this, you were sort of guided in this particular uh, interpretation of, of the Summa with this idea of wisdom. So let's have a basic idea of what the concept is. Yeah. Well, wisdom essentially means that there's higher truth beyond human reason. There is a there is truth that, that reason can deal with in terms of the first principle, which is God, uh, and that's human wisdom, which is higher than just human reasoning. Uh, but there is also then a wisdom that can be revealed by God in revelation, given in scripture, And even a kind of wisdom that can be given by the Holy Spirit, this is one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, that is a wisdom that gives you a kind of what they would call uh, connatural knowing of God, what we might call a kind of total integral human knowing. Uh, And for Thomas, wisdom is the highest form of all human uh, understanding and intellection. He talks about, you know, the uh, science, for example, scientia, as he called it, which is what we would call, you know, philosophical reasoning. Hmm. He talks about understanding intellectus, but the highest of all the the the, the gifts that can, and the, and the exercises of the human mind is wisdom, and wisdom is the highest because it orders everything that we can know in terms of the first good, the first principle, which is God. So that the science itself, on its own level, is fine. But wisdom gives you a higher form of understanding because it orders everything in relationship to God, who is the ultimate, the ultimate principle. So for Thomas, the Summa is a scientific book in the sense of Aristotle's notion of science, and he argues that in the first question of the first part. But more than a science, it's a wisdom. It's a sapientia because it's based on the wisdom found in Revelation. It makes use of the natural wisdom of philosophy and it also uses the wisdom that is the special gift of the Holy Spirit. So w- wisdom is essential to all of Thomas's uh, thinking. And this is something that's been known, uh, certainly in the past. I'm not in any sense discovering it. It's right there in the text. But it often hasn't been sufficiently emphasized hmm. by those who studied Thomas. I mean, there are exceptions to this. Uh, Jacques Maritain, a great Thomas and Etienne Gilson and various others have written about wisdom in Thomas and say, yes, wisdom is what's really essential. I fully agree with that. So what's interesting then is, is as Aquinas is working through uh, theological questions, he's drawing on the Bible, he's uh, attempting to adhere to the the tradition uh, of yeah. the church, the ongoing tradition of the church, but he's also appealing to um, classic philosophy and, and Aristotle uh, yes, and making that a part of it, right? So, yeah. so this is really interesting because did did Aquinas have a sense that he was taking religious beliefs and tr- maybe trying to match them up with respectable philosophical ideas, or maybe that his allegiance to God or, or or revelation might come into question to the extent that he adopted the categories of philosophy? Well, this was as I pointed out before. This was controversial. Yeah. And because there are some aspects of Aristotle's teaching that seem to be in conflict with Christian faith, Aristotle seems to argue that the universe is eternal. There's no real creation. Aristotle also seems to say that the first principle or the first cause uh, is not 
really exercising providence over this universe, etc. These are just two of the examples of things in Aristotle's teaching that seem to be in serious conflict with Christian teaching. So when Aristotle, Aristotle's full philosophy begins to be used in the late 12th century, early 13th century, it's condemned actually. And uh, local decrees and papal decrees say, oh, you can't teach the higher forms of Aristotle's philosophy. They couldn't mm. keep it out. It's too useful a tool because mm. it's so systematic and so complete. So by the 1240s, when Thomas Aquinas is studying philosophy in Paris with Albert the Great and others, they're, they're moving Aristotle back in. But this was controversial. How far can you move Aristotle in before you, you know, create problems with Christian thinking. Thomas Aquinas, like his teacher Albert, insisted that we can make heavy use of Aristotle, although certain corrections are going to be needed. Bonaventure and the Franciscans said, no, Aristotle's, um, you know, logic is very important and there are aspects of his thinking, but Aristotle's metaphysics is dangerous. It's mm -hmm. in conflict with, uh, with Christianity. Throughout his career, Thomas argues strenuously with uh, Franciscans and others on this case. And uh, in one place in uh, early, one of his early works, he says, there are people who accuse us of, you know, mixing the water of philosophy into Christian teaching. And he mm. says, we're not mixing it in, we're transforming the water into wine. Mm. That the true theologian can use philosophy, but in the course of using it under the the ages of revelation under the guidance of revelation as taught in the Bible, what Thomas called Sacra, Sacra Doctrina, the course of doing that, you transfuse that philosophical thinking into the wine of uh, theology. And so while the Summa Theologiae makes heavy use of philosophy throughout, it's not a philosophical book. It's not even a philosophy of religion or uh, et cetera. It's basically what he called sacra doctrina. It's sacred teaching. It's doctrinal teaching, which can use philosophy extensively to help clarify, deepen, and organize its own teaching. What would the what would the difference be if if the text uh, had been written more as philosophy, as you said? Well, I mean, the, the difference would be that certain things that are essential to uh, to uh, Christian teaching wouldn't be there. A good case is the whole question of creation, mm -hmm. questions 44 through 46 of the Prima Pars. As Thomas analyzes this, he says, you know, look, there are two things about creation to be understood, two basic principles. First of all, creation means that the whole of all that is, the whole of the universe is dependent upon God. And he said, that's a truth that's open both to philosophy and it's also taught in scripture. So you can make philosophical arguments that the universe doesn't explain itself. It needs a first cause. Mm -hmm. But then he said, there's another thing that we believe about, about creation. And that is that creation had a beginning. This is what we're told in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Now, what kind of a, what kind of a truth is that, that creation had a beginning? Thomas Aquinas insists that's a doctrinal truth. We only know it because it's in Revelation. Natural arguments, philosophical arguments on either side, it has to be eternal or it has to be temporal, don't work, says Thomas Aquinas. Thomas's opponents, including Bonaventure and Bonaventure's students like John of Peckham say, oh no, 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 wait, we can create philosophical arguments to say that the world must, be, must have begun in time. Thomas says, no, you can't. <laughs> you could, you, you, and he, he argues that very extensively uh, against Bonaventure and, and John of Peckham. All the arguments that they give for, that the, for the, you know, the temporality of the world, he says, these don't work philosophically. They're not legitimate arguments. They fall apart. So therefore, to give a full teaching about these two fundamental principles regarding creation, you, have to, you can make use of philosophy but you also have to use Sacra Doctrina. Mm -hmm. And you, in a certain sense, fuse the two together to make the most powerful kinds of arguments for what is the nature of creation, which is what he's laying out there in, in questions 44 through 46. It's a perfect example of what I call Thomas's balancing act, mm -hmm. you know, between what philosophy can do and what it can't do, where it needs Sacra Doctrina, and yet how important philosophy will be then for, you know, explaining and exposing uh, the truths uh, of the Christian faith for a deeper understanding. 
Okay, so so it wouldn't necessarily be fair or accurate then to say that for Aquinas he was allowing the the philosophical tail to wag the theological dog. Yeah, he would strongly resist that. He would say, "Oh no," he said. He would say, "Theology is sacra doctrina is what's fundamental. Philosophy is useful. Philosophy, mm-hmm. as he called it, is the ancilla. It is it's the servant of theology." Mm-hmm famous uh, phrase that's used uh, elsewhere. In other words, it's a very useful servant. You, 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 uh, you know, you do much better with it than without it, but that the sacra doctrina, the revelation, is what's fundamental to what Thomas Aquinas is trying to do. Thomas was a professor of theology. He knew a lot of philosophy, and he used philosophy, and he respected philosophy, but he knew it had its limits, and he himself was a theologian using philosophy. But in his own time, I mean, that was controversial because some philosophers, uh, some theologians, excuse me, some theologians said, oh no, philosophy is is kind of dangerous. Hmm. Some philosophers of his contemporaries used the other thing and they said, well, you know, philosophy is always correct and philosophy is Aristotle. So if Aristotle says the universe must be eternal, it's gotta be eternal from the viewpoint of reason, even if that conflicts with faith. So they held a strange view. It's often been called a double truth view, but they, they themselves didn't use that uh, that kind of language. But they held that something could be true in philosophy, but not true in theology. For Thomas, that's impossible because good reasoning has the same source that revelation does. The source is God. So the difficulty then pops up in the in terms of it, whether sacra doctrina uh, is being interpreted or understood correctly, right? And so, like, who who gets to arbitrate there? If there, if Thomas wasn't going to use philosophy to arbitrate between um, different, the, maybe, you know, to say whether or not creation was eternal or, you know, he just took that for granted because that's his uh, understanding of, of scripture and of church tradition, right? Well, he, he, scripture for him says that the world began in time. And so he says, yes, this is what I believe. So what about uh, figurative readings? Couldn't someone say, well, that's that's a figurative reading, and we can still – maybe this would be close to those, the other du- – the double truth type people where they could say, well, that's true what scripture says, but Aristotle's well, figurative, also right. Yeah, Figurative readings are interesting because Thomas also in the use of scripture tends to be a literalist. Hmm. That is, he recognizes that figurative readings are useful, but they're more useful for what we could t- today – say, would be moral instruction Mm -hmm. and uh, devotion. When he argues doctrinally in Socrates' Trina, he wants you to use the literal sense of the scriptural text. Now, his sense of the literal, uh, sense of the of the letter of the text is is a very nuanced one. It would take a while to uh, to explain it. But he doesn't want to argue in doctrinally from figurative senses of the scripture. They'll they'll sneak in from time to time in places where where he needs them, where it's uh, peripheral. But uh, the major issues for Thomas, you need to argue from the scriptures and from the tradition of the church. It's the belief of the church. It's the scripture as interpreted by the church. Thomas makes that quite clear. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just you open your Bible uh, and you start reading. It's the Bible as it has been taught by the fathers by the councils, by papal authority, etc. It's it's the Bible in the church, which is the source of sacra doctrina. Okay. There's a quote here from uh, from the book, from chapter 2, that I want to uh, read and, and get your get your comments about. And it, it pertains to your view of the Summa as growing out of Thomas's belief that our, our being embodied yes. Im- impacts our thinking about God. So here's what you write. You say, few, if any, Christian theologians made more of the fact that our thinking about God is tied to our existence as embodied subjects. Human attainment of truth is in and through the body and its senses, though the intellect abstracts the intelligible form from the matter perceived by the senses. Expand on that. Well, Thomas fundamentally agrees with Aristotle here and breaks company with uh, many of the platonically inspired theologians because Thomas insists that the soul is the form of the body. It's not kind of a separate thing that exists somehow distinct from the body. So that everything that we know intellectually in what they would call our soul comes to us through our embodied existence. That is, it has to, it has to start in the senses. And we always must insist in that. And it's also part of the whole economy of Christian salvation you know, that the second person, the Trinity, took on flesh, took on the whole human situation, body as well as soul. 
so that for Thomas, uh, epistemologically, as well as theologically, human embodiment is absolutely essential, both for both for belief and then also for what we do with our belief in our in, in our theology. Uh, so as I said, that epistemologically says Aristotle's right about how we come to know. Theologically, he says the whole Christian belief is that God became man, and therefore the, the body is essential to human nature, to human salvation. It's not a flight from the body and hmm. rescuing just of the soul. No, it's the restoration and of the entire human person. This is why something like the resurrection of the body is so crucial for, for Thomas uh, Aquinas as well. The, in terms of the resurrection, was, was that a difficult philosophical issue? Because today, I mean, that's one of the more difficult Christian beliefs, I think, is the idea that once we die and our bodies decay and they're, you know, we can yeah, see well, what happens. <laughs> it's always been a difficult issue from uh, Christianity uh, on. And this is why uh, many of the Greek uh, philosophers, you know, found Christianity so bizarre mm -hmm. because they thought certainly that the immortality of the soul, because the soul was pure and separate from the body. But, you know, resurrection of the body, what does that mean? Yeah. But I think it's crucial to a Jewish tradition because it starts, of course, in, in the Hebrew Bible. And it was also crucial to the early earliest Christians whose faith is founded on the fact that, yes, Jesus rose from the dead in a bodily form. And in some way, that's going to be our destiny as well. Now, the, the in some way uh, is, the, is the sticking point. Yeah. Because obviously the, the resurrection of the body, which is part of the Christian creed, by the way, of all major Christian mm -hmm. churches, the resurrection of the body, there are different ways of understanding what that's going to mean. And there's no single theology of the resurrection of the body. Some interpret resurrection in more of a spiritualizing way. Others, like Thomas, who's very much bound to the whole issue of the significance of embodiment, they're not going to be crudely literal, but they do believe that in the future there will be a restoration of our embodied form in some way. Right. So, I mean, that's that's another long issue. Thomas's own yeah. theology of the resurrection, of course, we don't have its, have its finished form in the Summa because he died before he did mm. that. What we do have is his students put together in something called the supplement. They put together some of his earlier reflections from his commentary on Peter Lombard's sentences what Thomas would have done with that had he lived to finish the whole Summa would be an interesting question. Would he have advanced his theology there? I think he would have, but we don't know. Yeah. How about apophatic theology and how that played a role? And, that, and if I understand correctly, that's the that's negative theology. That's sort of yeah. saying what isn't rather than saying what is that. And right. it seems like Aquinas employed that, but he also used philosophy to critique philosophy and sort of say, look, philosophy has blind spots as well. So, you know, to talk about that for, for, a, yeah. for a moment. Well, I think we, we have to remember that the human mind, wonderful as it is, and, and Thomas had a fantastic appreciation for the powers of the intellect, is finite. It's a created mind. God is by nature infinite, so that God alone can understand God's self. God can reveal aspects of his being to us, but he reveals it to us insofar as our minds are limited as well. And this is why Thomas strongly insists that we can never know what God is. We can never know what God is because only God can know what God is. Only an infinite mind can, can appreciate the nature of the infinite uh, being of God. Hence, every, anything that we know about God, either naturally through philosophy or theologically through revelation, is always geared to the kind of mind that we have, which has necessary limitations. So we know we better speak about God by saying what God is not than by saying what God is. Thomas repeats this over and over again. We still have to, of course, say what we can, mm -hmm. but we have to recognize that fundamentally anything that we can say is infinitely less than what could be said by by God by God Himself. So Thomas is deeply negative or or apophatic in all of his theology, as I pointed out before. One way of phrasing this is Thomas says, you know, we can know that God is, we can argue that God is is, but we can never try to argue what God is. Hmm. All we have are hints, and if you will, traces of the fact that, you know, we know that God is an intellect, we know that God has a will, but how that divine intellect and will really operate, we can't know because our minds, our intellects and wills are finite, and his is infinite. 
And that, that's Bernard McGinn. He's the author of a biography about a book, a biography of uh, the Sumith Theologiae. Uh, it's part of Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Book series. This is the Maxwell Institute podcast. We'll take a break and come right back. Hey, this is Blair Hodges. First, I want to thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm interrupting my own interview to invite you to help me out. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm just asking you to take a moment to rate this show in the iTunes store. Even better, write a review in the iTunes store and tell us why you listen to the podcast. Or share a link to the episode on your Facebook wall. Tweet it. Burn a CD for your folks. Send up smoke signals. If you rate the Maxwell Institute podcast in the iTunes store, that's the simplest way you can help us. But I also hope that you enjoy these interviews enough to let a few of your friends know about us, too. Thanks again for listening. We're back with Bernard McGinn. He's the author of a biography of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae as part of Princeton's Great Lives of Religious Books series. You mentioned just a moment ago uh, that Thomas didn't get to finish the, the Summa. Uh, mm-hmm. What happened there? Well, what happened is uh, is still a very uh, puzzling uh, uh, event. Uh, December the 6th of 1273 was the feast of St. Uh, Nicholas. Uh, Thomas is living in Naples and trying to finish the Summa. He's deep into the third part of the Summa. Something happens, and Thomas never wrote again. Uh, when his friend and, and companion Reginald says, you know, notices that he's not himself really, and he says, you haven't been writing, and... Uh, Thomas says, I cannot. I cannot write. He says, everything that I've written seems like straw to me. Um, the, uh, accounts that's a lot of, of straw. If that's, that's a lot case. of straw. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, um, I mean, the medieval uh, hagiographers, the people who wrote the lives of Thomas as a saint, say, oh, he had a vision of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, this vision of God uh, told him that, no, you really can't write about God, and you're just going to have to uh, have to stop. Modern interpreters, uh, fa- famous uh, biography, biographers of uh, Thomas, like uh, the Dominicans Jean-Pierre Torrell and, and um, uh, James Weishaupt and others have said, well, you know, if you look at Thomas's life, he had been working himself at an unhuman pace for 10 or 15 years in all of his writing and his journeying and his teaching. And maybe he had a breakdown of some description, mm. either a physical or mental breakdown or a stroke, because it seems some of the descriptions seem to describe him as maybe, you know, having had been impaired in some way. Now, I don't think that those explanations are, are you know, necessarily uh, opposed. I mean, he, he might right. have had some kind of physical thing as well as some kind of spiritual experience. But he gave up writing. He's dead within three months. Wow. It's interesting that the end was so, historically speaking, cloudy that that someone at that moment didn't didn't, or at least that we don't have a record. Yeah, well, you know, even with, well, even even the medical uh, people at that time really didn't know much about any of these things. Uh, when you know modern conceptions of a stroke, they might have said, well, you know, Thomas needs to rest and he needs to be bled, which is what they yeah. do to people then, and and et cetera. So I think myself, it was kind of a combination. I mean, he yeah. was a man devoted to deep prayer throughout his lo- his life, and he might have had a unique prayer experience, a contemplative experience, a vision of God in some way, but he also might well have had, uh, you know, some kind of a stroke or even some kind of a mental, uh, you know, mental impairment for a while because he worked himself into exhaustion. So the, the, the quote about how he said everything I've written is like straw to me, was that, uh, was that written quite a bit later or was that more well it, it, record? It, it comes it comes from stories told by reginald and uh, and others okay. so you know it might we don't know so it's at least traced to people who knew him and it's not it, something that appeared out of whole cloth in the when the hagiographies were being written no it, exactly and we okay. do have accounts you know of him being more abstracted than ever mm-hmm. and is not feeling well so that when he was going he's journeying to the council held in southern france and he has to sit on a mule and then he hits his head against a, a tree limb or something like that. Yeah. It sounds like somebody who really was impaired. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. So so then he died, but his work obviously stayed with the church. And it's important here to talk about the area, time immediately after his death, you know, in 1274. It's very controversial for the next 20 or 30 years. The Franciscans mount a campaign against him, hmm. uh, writing what they call corrections. 
of the Summa. Everybody was reading the Summa. Yeah. So the Franciscans, a number of Franciscans, particularly one English Franciscan, sat down and wrote, wrote a correction of the Summa. He goes through and he lists all the places in the Summa that are, that are incorrect or erroneous and gives you the correct view from the Franciscan theologians. Dominicans obviously responded and they corrected the correction, <laughs> <laughs> etc. So, I mean, Tom, everybody's reading Thomas, I think, because he was so important. But it's very, very controversial, and it's very controversial until uh, 1323, when he is canonized by yeah, Pope John. Briefly Thomas. describe what that means for, for my listeners, too, about canonization. Well, it, this means that he's officially declared a saint by papal authority. And, you know, the, early on in the church, people were, became saints by martyrdom or by kind of general acclamation or local acclamation. Part of the papal organization of the church was to say only the pope can declare a saint. And this is what's becoming in the 12th and 13th century. And, of course, what's still with Roman Catholicism today. Canonization means declaring somebody a saint, putting him in the canon of, of recognized saints is a papal prerogative. And this is what Pope John the 21st does with uh, with Thomas Aquinas in 1323. And that stops criticism. I mean, mm. uh, it, it's people are going to continue to disagree with Thomas Aquinas, but the notion that, you know, there's a lot of error in there and dangerous stuff, uh, that, that pretty much is going to uh, be ruled out by the fact that Thomas is recognized as, uh, as a saint. Uh, so that must have so, helped in terms of you know reception history, keeping keeping him a live option, right? And and if you can talk briefly about uh, the reception of Thomas's work, you talk about Thomists and Neo Thomists. What, what are those? Yeah, well, from early on, that is from the beginning of the 14th century, people begin to talk about Thomas Tomatiste in uh, in Latin. That is, people who who deliberately say, you know, we're following the theology of Thomas Aquinas. Now, of course, they understood that in different ways, so not all Thomists uh, are going to be holding exactly the same views. But the Dominicans, for the large part, not all, but most Dominicans, and many other medieval teachers called themselves Thomists, that they, they were followers in general of the theology of Thomas uh, Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is not the only theologian or the only theological school in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. There were Scotists who followed the theology of Duns Scotus. There were people who called themselves Albertists who followed the theology of Albert the Great. There were people who called themselves the, the Moderniste who followed the critical uh, theolo theology and philosophy of people like William of Ockham and uh, and others. So there were many schools of, uh, of theology and that continued down you know, well into uh, into the early modern period, this, at the Council of Trent in the 16th century, you know, the, the, the legend is that they put the Summa on the altar at Trent next to the scriptures. That's a legend. There were Thomas there at the Council of Trent, but there were also Franciscans who followed Bonaventure. There were Scotus. There were Augustinian theologians. There were other theologians, and there was a lot of discussion. An argument among these various theological uh, schools. Most of the decrees of the Council of Trent try to tread a middle path, you know, that will be open to interpretation by the different schools according to their own uh, their own viewpoint. So it's not a Thomist council in, yeah. in any way. Uh, Thomas Aquinas doesn't become a kind of universal or supreme, I guess universal is probably wrong, supreme would be better. He doesn't become a supreme teacher until the middle of the 19th century when there's a revival of Thomas thought that starts about the 1850s or so and that for various reasons gets adopted by the papacy. So the famous encyclical of Leo XIII, you know, attorney, attorney Patris of 1879 declares that Thomas is the teacher, the fundamental and supreme teacher of Roman Catholicism. This was done for a number of political and intellectual reasons that I discuss in the book. And so the Catholicism that I grew up in in the 1940s and 1950s was basically a, the a theological world of neo-Thomism. What sort of doctrines made it neo-Thomism? Like what were the actual teachings that, that would have were characteristic of that? Well, it, interestingly enough, most of the teachings that characterized neo-Thomism were actually philosophical teachings uh, more than they were theological teachings. And it was also more, in a certain sense, of an academic uh, 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 and uh, educational pattern because Pope Leo and many of his successors in the early 20th century say, you have to teach Thomas Aquinas or you have to teach textbooks based on Thomas Aquinas. Uh, 
Frequently, these textbooks, however, were not really very true to Thomas himself. Huh. They were often influenced by other interpreters of Thomas. So a lot of the stuff that was taught as Thomism were textbooks that really weren't weren't adequate to Thomas himself. So it's just like ideas about how creation happened, or like what sometimes type of- ideas about creation, sometimes ideas about the nature of the human soul, ideas about the relationship of the essence and existence of things. I mean, their whole list of of more philosophical than yeah. theological. So did uh, it really get down to the Catholic and the pew then? If, if it well. Was- what got down to the Catholic in the pew that Thomas was it. Thomas was the great thinker. And so most people who went to a Catholic college uh, in those days would have had to read some Thomas Aquinas, which is certainly a good thing. Uh, not a lot of the Summa, but some parts of the Summa. And all Catholics would know, yeah, Thomas Aquinas is our guy. <laughs> you know, he's our... He's so he's our, kind of looked to like the, an intellectual, uh, powerful figure, or... Well, he, he had the answers to all the errors, because okay. part of this, you see, was a counterattack against modern philosophy, yeah. modern science, modern secularism. Thomas was such a comprehensive thinker and such a carefully organized thinker that the neo thomas say, look, Thomas is our guy. He's got all the answers to all these errors that are kind of out yeah. there. Uh, so that it was as much a political event as it was an intellectual event. And yeah, that's it interesting because rather than having like a new Thomas sort of appear on the scene at the time when neo thomism became yeah. prominent, they yeah. looked back to Thomas – yeah, and uh, you know Thomas is is an amazing thinker, and he does give you a, a sense, uh, a, a synthetic and a universalizing pers- uh, perspective mm. from which to argue against argue certain kinds of cases. The problem is that both philosophically and theologically, Thomas is a great thinker, but there's no greatest thinker. Yeah. There never has been a greatest thinker. You know, you can say Plato and Aristotle will always be read. But is Plato the greatest philosopher? It's it's not. It's a mistake. It's a, it's a category error. To, in, in terms of thought, to say somebody is the greatest. Yeah. Uh, so Thomas is a great thinker, certainly one of the greatest theologians that Christianity ha- has ever had. But he himself would say he's just one theologian among others, trying to uh, to do his best. So what mm. happened in a certain sense with Neo Thomism? Then it was self defeating because it put Thomas in a position that no one should ever be put in. Yeah. And then the second reason why it was self-defeating was it had a very unhistorical view of Thomas Aquinas. That is, that he's kind of a mind that floats free of all time, giving the answer yeah. to all questions. We know the questions change. Things develop. Modern philosophy takes up issues that Thomas had never thought of, nor could he have thought of in his own time. So the uh, to dehistoricize Thomas and to put him in a su- position as the supreme teacher was actually a, a big, big mistake that eventually <laughs> was more or less realized. By the 1930s and 1940s, you know, despite the fact that papal authority is still saying Thomas is our guy, great thinkers are already saying, well, you know, Thomas is a wonderful thinker. I'm very inspired, but I have to answer, I have to take up these new questions, philosophical yeah. and theological. And so neo thomism was hollowed out from within already in the 1950s, and then when the Second Vatican Council came along, everybody says all of a sudden... It was in the 60s, right? It was Vatican II. 1960s, Vatican II. Yeah, sure, 1963 through 65. Suddenly people say, yeah, Thomas is great, but look, there's all this other theology, and there's all these important issues that Thomas could never have thought of that we need to confront. So neo-Thomism collapses. You know, some people say, oh, that was awful. There are still people who are running around saying this was the worst thing that ever happened. I think it was the best thing that ever happened for mm-hmm. Thomas Aquinas because it enabled the new generation, now two generations of theologians and philosophers, to go back to Thomas himself and to see what's really still useful and what's important in what he said and what is, you know, time bound and also not not even perhaps uh, perhaps correct. One of the great uh, German scholars of Thomas described uh, this situation since Vatican II as Thomas is finally released from house arrest. <laughs> <laughs> because he had, he had been kept under house arrest, <laughs> yeah. and now now he's free to be himself. And, and so, so he's more the, of like a springboard now, rather than a, someone who you have to basically just say, I affirm everything he affirmed, right? Exactly. So, you know, exactly. And that's, I think, what's made this a very creative period, mm. 
for the study of Thomas Aquinas because we, we can study him now on his own. We can see him back in his historical context. We can study him for the, the wonderful things that he does and still worth thinking about. We don't have to say everything he said was right or that he's the ultimate answer to all problems. Uh, and we need to go, we need to recognize theology has always been a rich symphony and that issues develop that need to be spoken of in today's language and with today's modes of thinking that are very different from what Thomas Aquinas's were. And since they are different, what would you say to, to your average Catholic in the pew or, or to people from different religious traditions about why it would be worthwhile to still engage with the Summa? Well, it's like engaging with any great thinker. I mean, uh, in Christianity, we think of Augustine's Confessions, or we think of some of the writings of Luther, his On the Freedom of the Christian, um, or you can think of writings of Jonathan Edwards and others within the, you know, or, or William James and the, uh, you know, in, in, in the tradition of, uh, of American theological and philosophical writing. These are great thinkers. And um, to engage with really great minds like that, even when they're far from us historically, or when we might not necessarily agree with uh, everything that they say, is an opening up of the mind. And I think that's why I find Thomas so inspiring and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, just engaging for, uh, for me, it gives me energy, energizing, I guess is the, is the word. And I would say to others, I invite you to, to try that as well. Thomas is difficult reading, because it's very spare and uh, very scientific and, and articulate, but if you penetrate, you know, beyond the, the 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 letter and the structure, you see one of the great minds at work and a mind worth thinking along with. Oh, well, I think that's great. And and people who are interested in that can, uh, rather than trying to digest the entire Summa, maybe they can begin with this short book that's part of Princeton's Lives of Great Religious Books series. It's Bernard McGinn's Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologiae, and it's a great book, and I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to me. Okay, thank you, Blair. My, I wrote that book as an introduction to try to inspire people to pick up the Summa. Well, in my case, your book was a success. Okay, that's great. I really appreciated talking with you. Yeah, this was great. This was really-